Thank you very much. Such a great pleasure and honor for me to be back in India. Last time I was in the incredible India was 2019 in Chennai and then Hyderabad. And I think that was a few months before uh, COVID started. Uh, so hopefully once again, the world starts being relatively normal so that we can start traveling and interacting. With that in mind, I don't have much to contribute to what the richness of uh, dietary management is coming from Indian experts, especially nephrologists and dietitians in India. I'll try my best to put together what I have had here and also uh, some amounts of it I have learned, good significant amounts of it I've learned from colleagues in India, including Dr. Nayak. So uh, World Kidney Day is important since I also I have privilege to be in the uh, steering committee of the World Kidney Day. And especially since this year is about World Kidney Day's theme is about living well with kidney disease and next year is kidney health for all. So please remember in March, 2022, celebrate kidney health, health for all, all and in the upcoming three months of 2021, living well with kidney disease. That means if you have a kidney disease, you need to be able to live well and long. So I'm using some of these uh, papers and textbooks uh, to present today's presentation. And now living well with kidney disease is about some of the statements here. Patients' priorities, values, and goals. After being the, a nephrologist for over two decades, I've come to believe that if everything is done in, in a good amount, what I learned, for example, from India, less dialysis in earlier stages, more dialysis in later stages. And to advance research practice policy, there is increasing recognition of the need uh, to identify patients' priorities. So everything is about our patients because we serve patients. We are there because of the patients. And patients need hope a feeling of trust and hope can be aggravated when there are choices. If you look at our traditional approach, we tell the patients that dialysis needs to start, patient needs dialysis. If you don't want dialysis, then go to the path of no dialysis and in the US it's called hospice medicine and essentially path of end of life. But what we would like to emphasize is that there is no dichotomy. Somewhere in between, we should be able to help patients instead of saying either supportive care or dial, full dial is life-saving care, that we are here to expand the choices. And the choices come from nutritional and lifestyle modifications. So I would like to emphasize again that patients appreciate ability to be free free dialysis freedom as long as possible. Now, I am in charge of two large dialysis centers, so I'm a very pro-dialysis person. Like an oncologist who's a pro-chemotherapy, but in the right dose and, and in the appropriate timing. So going back to hope, hope can be expanded and enforced by choice. Choice. And choice is not a dichotomy. That means I have to expand this. I have to be able to tell a patient that, hey, I can help you to preserve kidney function longer. That's conservative management that's associated with even longer survival if it's done correctly. And when you need help, I can help you with your symptom management. And when you need to start dialysis, I can help you to start dialysis gradually not abruptly and frequently and intensely. And then at the end, when you need adjustment for dialysis, I can help you. So these are things plus more we should offer to our patients. And for now, if there is a patient with CKD, I have to say that, hey, I can help you to delay and defer dialysis. And that's what I learned. And we nephrology in, in the US, we need to learn from India among others. And it's not just for the old patients. They think in the US that this is for the old patients, this is for all patients. So if we focus on the first one, conservative and preservative management, kidney preserving therapy, 
by diet and lifestyle modifications. And this is essentially to highlight the green area here. That means allowing slower progression, delaying dialysis, deferring dialysis, and yet making patients live long and, and be healthier. So in this Lancet paper, I, I was privileged to contribute, which was published last month. It's a, a comprehensive review of CKD. Here we define preservative management or kidney preserving therapy means prolonging dialysis free time, achieving the greatest survival. So because some people say that avoiding dialysis means to go to the path of end of life, as I said, no, that's not the case. It is combining non-pharmacologic strategies on top of ACE, ARB, and SCL2 inhibitors, no matter how impressed we are with these medications. And, and once again, let me just put this in the middle of the kidney care chart, kidney preserving care, plus symptom management when it's needed hospice, but a main part of kidney preserving care, as you can see here, is diet and lifestyle modification. And this was also highlighted last year in 2020 about secondary and tertiary prevention of CKD, which as you see is all about, among others, of course, diet and lifestyle, lower protein, more plant, plant dominant, and allowing us to slow progression. So in the United States, fortunately, this is becoming something more important nowadays. Still, have, we have a long way to go, especially after the problems that the, the, the challenges of the uh, uh, MDRD study of 25 years ago. At that time, and even now, the uh, low protein diet is considered 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day, not kilogram. Is it ideal body weight? Is it real body weight? That discussion continues. Even K Doki didn't end that discussion. If anything, add to more. And then lower protein, that means less than 0 0.4, 0 0.3, which is very low protein diet. Now, uh, this is what K Doki says if you don't have diabetes, 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 grams of protein per, per day. And if you have diabetes, 0 0.6 to 0.8. It did not, Kedoki did not specify the amount of the source of protein. Should it be from plants or from meat? They didn't specify that. That was one of the areas they did not say a lot. They did not say much, actually. And looking at the MDRD study of 1994, if you look at here, the problem was that they said the study was negative. The study was negative, but then... I would like to remind colleagues, anybody who talks about the modification of diet in real disease, you should always re remind colleagues that diabetes was excluded. In 1990s, at that time, they said diabetes is a rare disease. We don't even need to include this in the MDRD study. Now in India and US, major, a, a, a large proportion of patients have diabetes and polycystic kidneys was overrepresented. And yet the, the study was positive. Why? Because while ACE and ARBs, they work on the efferent arterial, low protein diet and SGLT2 inhibitors, they work on the afferent part of the arterial, of the, I'm sorry, of the glomeruli. And this is the afferent arterial of the glomeruli. If you look at here, let me just highlight again, as you can see, vasoconstriction that happens with low protein diet and with plant-based diet is important. Now, I would like to try with your help to revive the concept of hyperfiltration of glomeruli. This is a very important concept, which was highlighted 30 years ago. And look at here, diabetes, high dietary protein intake, especially animal protein leads to glomerular hyperfiltration. And if you look at the history, look, if you find here in 1982, Brenner and, and Tim, Tim Meyer and Hosseter, they wrote a, a landmark review paper that put together all this data. And they said 30 years ago, which makes it 70 years ago from now, our science already found glomerular hyperfiltration due to high protein intake. It is something that was so established at that time, and we forgot, we, com we completely said goodbye to this, and our effort is to bring this back to the front line, to the prime time. If you look at here, animals who eat meat, they double to triple 
their e their GFR within 30 minutes of eating meat. Why? Because they they need that. This was an evolutionary adaptation based on what these animals needed, animals that are based on meat. Now, are we human based on meat? We are not like them, right? Look at here again. This is a dog who just ate chicken and is sleeping and his GFR has doubled. Now, and triple, look at here, GFR rise by several hundred percent within two to three hours of heavy blood eating in, the, in these bats and vampire bats. So these animals, usually like a dog doesn't live more than 15 years. A, a bat is also, life is restricted to a few years. And for us, for mankind, maybe in the past, where a life expectancy of four to 50 years, for those societies that were based on eating meat, that was something that was not important. And, and even in us, in human, amino acids surge this to increase GFR. If you look at here again, once again, let me highlight another paper from 1991, but this is pure research. Kathy Tutel, who is in the Seattle area, she at that time, found that in volunteer diabetic patients versus non-diabetic patients, when you inject infuse amino acids, look at here, GFR goes from 95 to 160s within half an hour to an hour. And in people who don't have diabetes, it also goes up, but in diabetic patients, it goes even higher. So hyperfiltration is even more burdensome in people with diabetes. And imagine now some people, some dietitians tell the diabetic patients eat more protein to lose weight. So by lowering the amount of protein, especially the meat part, there is a, a decline or adapted decline in GFR. Now, again, we try to highlight this in figure two of the Lancet paper of last month. And, and once again, I wanted to also to highlight here that diet and medications together, they work, not one versus the other. So it's, we're not saying that, hey, either you're pro pharmacology or pro diet. We need to really highlight what, for instance, cardiologists do. Cardiologists never give statin and says, don't go and eat whatever you want. They have a combination of diet and pharmacotherapy. So if you look at, again, MDRD study, if MDRD study has started three months later, the study would have been declared positive, despite the fact that majority of patients or a large number of patients with polycystic kidney patients whose progression is extremely slow, yet there was positive signal here. And the reason that initially GFR was worse in the first three months in the low, diet, uh, low protein diet patients is because is what we see in SCLT2 inhibitors or a ACE and ARB. It's, we don't even question that, but when it was about this in the early study, people use this to discredit the results. Now, let me highlight the second, uh, the, the, the other question, which is can lowering protein intake or not eating meat cause protein energy wasting or malnutrition? So, there are so many, there are a good number of uh, research uh, based data suggesting that the amount of protein that is required as the basic and uh, to maintain to, or to avoid catabolic rate is 0.46 to 0.5, not even 0.6 or 0.7 or 0.8, 0.46. Assuming there is adequate essential amino acids, so the Institute of Medicine or the American Academy of Medicine, which is the new name now, has recommended through its food and uh, uh, the, the food section that the recommended dietary allowance of protein is 0 0.8, which is 35% uh, higher than the 0 0.6. So therefore, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 is considered safe. And 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 is what also considered as what should be uh, recommended to patients with CKD stage one through stage five, not on dialysis, and including those on dialysis who still make urine. Now, in the past, again, 25 years ago, they used to say that if you lower protein, half of it should be high biologic value protein. But this is now being replaced by half of it should be from plant-based protein. 
and is plant dominant. Now, are there data about that? And then some colleagues say that if you are worried about so very low uh, inadequate amino acids, or if you give very low protein diet, then supplement this with essential amino acids or ketones of amino acids, which is yet another discussion. We in our center, we invariably ask patients every three to six months to, to help to collect 24-hour urine. We look at accuracy of 24-hour urine and all the data related to that. And, and we calculate uh, based on urine, urine nitrogen and estimate the amount of protein that patient is taking. Now we use potassium, not to lower potassium, but we use it to see if patient is eating adequate vegetables. If the potassium in the urine is less than three grams or four grams, I say, hey, you're not eating enough fruits and vegetables. So that's, now juxtapose this to the traditional approach that potassium is high. So if I could highlight here, what is recommended, some of us, including myself, we take issue with the low potassium and we say that potassium should be 4.7 grams per day coming from fibers, fiber-based diet. It must be natural potassium. Why? Because if it's com it comes from fruits and vegetables and, 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 and plant-based diet, then it helps with, gas with uh, gastrointestinal transition and, and, uh, and helps avoiding or preventing uh, or uh, lowering the likelihood of constipation, which is the cause, constipation is usually the cause of hypercalemia. Now, another contribution of our group we, under Dr. Rhee and Dr. Narasaki a few months ago in the journal, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is that in, in people with GFR below 60, high protein diet is actually associated with worse outcomes above 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. Now it's very interesting. And then the question about high biologic value, which essentially means meat, high biologic value means mostly meat. And as you can see here in, in people with EGFR below 60, high biologic value, that means second and third tertiary ter ter was associated with unfavorable outcomes. So therefore the, no the old notion that high biologic value is, is uh, is something important and useful, especially in low protein diet is, is here seriously questioned. Now, in data from France, for example, as this one says, the lower is the protein, the better. So, but how low can we go if the lower is the better in terms of CKD outcomes? So initially, if you if uh, colleagues remember 10 minutes ago, I mentioned that uh, I, I reminded colleagues that 0 0.3, around 0.3 is very low protein diet. It needs, uh, traditionally to be supplemented with essential amino acids or ketones of amino acids. There's a review paper about this in AJKD by colleagues, Dr. Koppel, myself, and Dr. Uh, Anuja Shah it, at Harbor UCLA. And here, the reminder that keto analogs of amino acids are generated inside your liver. That means these are not synthetics. The amination of amino acid leads to a, an ongoing process of having keto analogs inside your liver right now. And then studies from Italy, such as Brunori studies from 13 years ago, suggesting that uh, uh, deferring diets with very low protein diet keto analogs helps without uh, adding, to, uh, uh, without compromising survival. Now, when colleagues ask me, are there pure research data that plant-based, that more plant-based helps? I say, yes, there are some good data. One is uh, from a colleague in Greece who went to UK, who did this study. And I, I copied and pasted this amazing presentation by Dr. Nike, as you can see here. And, and he showed that it's not just quantity of protein, but quality, quality. That means if, if the protein source is vegetable based, then you see similar impact as if you have lowered the amount of protein. That means the glomerular hyperfiltration goes down, subsides. GFR goes down, which is essentially what SCL2 uh, inhibitor people are very proud. They say, hey, we lowered GFR. And uh, here also epidemiologic data from Dr. Uh, Srini Bedu in Salt Lake City showing the same thing again across uh, the uh, population. When there is more than 50% source of protein coming from plants, also, 
the hazard ratio of mortality CKD patient goes down. So altogether, based on this data, we suggested that the plant dominant is a compromise for those who don't want 100% vegetarian. We say that at least try 50% and then plant dominant level one and level two, that means 50 to 75% being from plants and 75 above up to 100% uh, being from plants essentially becoming vegan. And, uh, 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 and try essentially plant dominant means PLA, plant dominant means DO, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, pesco-vegetarian, lacto-vegetarian, and, and the uh, uh, favorable things that uh, colleagues have discussed probably the entire time I, when I joined, I noticed such a great and rich discussion was ongoing about so many different aspects of plant-based diet from uh, avoiding acidosis to hyperphosphatemia to improving high, uh, to uh, increasing uh, uh, fiber intake to uh, favorable impact on microbiome and so many other things. And data are essentially overwhelming nowadays. Actually, we, I would still say we need much more data. We need actually more studies, translational studies to look at this. And, and there are pilot data such as this one. There are data that corroborate to the concept and also consistent with the culture, with the culture in many nations, including in India, where you guys should be very proud and, and should really capitalize on, on this. Now, in the last few minutes, let me just uh, go over another part. But when I say that we expand choices, one is also you do all these great things and patient still is going eventually. I mean, the more the, the pro, you, pro, you prolong life of CKD patient, the more likely that they still are around and at some point need dialysis. And when that's the case, the, the more that I learned in 2012 in, in uh, India, that means in South India, actually, since I was there for a few weeks, in, in Bangalore and Chennai is, is gradual transition to dialysis. And this is what now we, perf we uh, perform relatively widely in Southern California. So if you look at here, I'm highlighting two areas, incremental transition to dialysis and preservation of residual kidney function. Patients who start dialysis, they still have, many of them, they make urine, and it's about incremental transition to dialysis or what we learn from Indian colleagues. Indian colleagues, they, they were not, some of them at least were not very proud of that. And I said, hey, you should be very proud of what you're doing. And if you do it correctly, during the correct phase, that means initial first few months, then there is, there is a lot of uh, reasons to believe and, and uh, that is something favorable. So instead of starting everybody on twice weekly, start once a week, twice a week. And then gradually, if patient is a kidney function, subsides, then go to thrice weekly and maybe daily dialysis, and then at the, at the end, palliative dialysis. But we look at here, the model that also comes from uh, South Italy and Japan is to do one day or two days a week dialysis and on non-dialysis day to continue low or very low protein diet. And the question as to whether this is where plant-based diet can continue on non-dialysis days or on dialysis days, you can and uh, liberalize uh, uh, protein intake. This is the concept. There are some data, but we don't have a lot. We need a lot more data to be supportive of this uh, dialysis and, and nutrition-based initiation transition. So uh, I, at the end, I would like to acknowledge your word kidney day. Once again, we're here living well with kidney disease. If a person has kidney disease, he or she needs to live well and long. And in conclusion, I'm going to highlight what this incredible culture told us 30 centuries ago. 300 centuries, I'm sorry, it's 3000 BC, sorry about that. So when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And this one is even more accurate and relevant. Now, 3000 years later, and we in the International Society of Rhythm and Metabolism are working on world kidney recipes to, to make a multicultural approach. And I apologize that one or two of this is based on meat because we want it to be uh, inclusive. And, uh, and I would like to encourage all colleagues, especially when 
we're going to meet in two years, hopefully two and a half years in, in Hyderabad for the International uh, Congress on Energy and Metabolism under leadership of Dr. Nayak. We're going to have a larger collection of world kidney recipes, especially based on what we learn from South India, North India, from Gujarat, from any, uh, so many amazing cultures from Bengali who also have uh, Bengali colleagues and, 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 and uh, colleagues in, in Kochi who also have uh, uh, some touch of uh, fish, for example, all these things together, which is all about conservative and preservative management. We, we diversify things, but with more emphasis on plant dominant components. That means low and very low protein diet. So it's not just any plant, uh, plant based or vegetarian. It's, it, the amount of protein should be on the low to very low side. The more, uh, and, and it has to be more plant dominant. That means at least 50% of the source should be uh, from plant, if not even more. And incremental dialysis for those who need to start dialysis, but also less dialysis and more emphasis on low protein diet and plant dominant diet on non dialysis days. And, and in summary, there is an urgent need to pursue more conservative and kidney preserving, preserving therapy for CKD using nutrition and diet in order to prolong and preserve kidneys and patients. Acknowledging colleagues from uh, University of California and in, in uh, UCLA, UC Irvine, and also appreciation uh, and acknowledging uh, acknowledgement of International Federation of Kidney Foundation, World Kidney Alliance and World Kidney Day. And this is my Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn at Cam Calentine. Thank you very much.